I gave to the people as much esteem as is sufficient for them, not detracting from their honour or reaching out to take it. And to those who had power and were admired for their wealth, I declared that they should have nothing unseemly. I stood holding my mighty shield against both, and did not allow either to win an unjust victory. Solon, taken from the Athenian constitution by Aristotle. Hello, I'm Mark Selick, and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 10, Athens, the City of Theseus. Now that we have seen the development of the Spartans, and how their society operated, we will leave them for now and focus on the Athenians. I will also be dealing with the Athenians over two episodes, before we then take a look at the Persians, and give them much the same treatment. Once we have done that, we will be in a good place to pick up the narrative with all our main players, just before the breakout of the Greco-Persian Wars. Athens and what developed there has to many peoples, in its own times and all the way to ours, has been the pinnacle of cultural achievement. It would become the birthplace of democracy. The beginnings of our modern day legal system start here. Thought and reason, through the many philosophers that developed there, still influence our morals and ethics today, while the arts from classical Athens still influence today's entertainment. Though before we see these cultural achievements, we need to head back further into Athens' past and try and find out what led to these developments, and what the origins of these people were. First we'll head to prehistoric times, to see what was happening, the site that would become Athens, and look at what the archaeological evidence tells us. Also we will look into the traditional origin myth of Athens, which we find in Herodotus' histories, and which the Athenians themselves were told. We will take a look at the early history once Athens had emerged from the Dark Ages, which will then lead us into the reforms and changes that were taking place there. The beginnings of a law code will emerge from a figure known as Draco. And we will also take a look at another immensely important figure, known as Solon, who would reform Athenian society, leading to the start of Athenian democracy. Though this would prove to be a long, slow process, shaped by events rather than the idea. That should round out this episode and set us up for the second part, where events and people would stray Athens away from their democratic path, though these of themselves would make sure that what began would not be forgotten and would eventually continue to evolve with the political climate. Let's now turn to the origins of Athens and the story associated with it. The site of Athens, located where modern day Athens is today, is one of the oldest continually inhabited sites that is still in use today. The site which is situated atop a rocky outcrop, known as the Acropolis, has so far shown evidence of human habitation from some 5,000 years ago. The site was almost certainly chosen originally due to its excellent natural defensive qualities and the ability to survey the surrounding countryside. The geography of the region, which is known as Attica, would help shape the Athenian character as they developed with their sense of individualism being at the top of the list. The countryside was ill-suited to the raising of wheat fields, but the dry and stony soil was much more suited for the growing of olive trees. The region was dotted with hills and mostly surrounded by mountains with open access to the sea to the west. Deposits rich in lead and silver would be discovered in the region, which the Athenians would exploit to their advantage. The name Athens appears to have first originated with a pre-Greek dialect, but in Greek-speaking times was associated with Apollos' patron goddess Athena, which could still be drawing on a more ancient past. Many ancient writers explain how Athens received its name through an origin myth. The myth has the god Poseidon and the goddess Athena competing to become patrons of the city. Poseidon, the brother of Zeus, was the god of the sea and also referred to as the earth shaker. As he used a trident, he is commonly shown carrying to not only whip up storms at sea, but also create earthquakes on land. Athena, the daughter of Zeus, and born from his brow fully grown and in armour, was the goddess of wisdom, reason and purity but was also represented as a fierce protector of the city from outside invaders. Both gods provided a gift each, so that the city would honour one of them by naming the city after them. Poseidon struck his trident into the earth and created a spring. Athena instead provided the city with an olive tree, which was the gift that was accepted, and so Athens honoured Athena. Herodotus in his histories talks about a saltwater spring and an olive tree housed in a sanctuary on the Acropolis, and says, According to the Athenians, they were put there by Poseidon and Athena, when they contested possession of the land as tokens of their claim to it. According to Herodotus, 
This sacred olive tree still grew on the Acropolis when the Persians raised Athens in 479 BC. He said, Now this olive was destroyed by fire together with the rest of the sanctuary. Nevertheless, on the very next day, when the Athenians were ordered by the king to offer the sacrifice, went up to the sacred place, they saw that a new shoot, 18 inches long, had sprung from the stump. The original tree is then supposed to have still existed into the time of the writer Pausanias, in the 2nd century AD, as he mentions the same stories above when talking about what was found in the shrine in his own times. These two gifts also symbolise the Athenians and what they represented, with the saltwater spring explaining their connection to the sea as they were to become a great sea power, while the olive tree represented peace and prosperity, how any emerging great culture and civilization would like to think of themselves. Like the Spartans' relationship to Heracles, the Athenians also had a foundation story tied up with a hero of the past. The Athenians' hero was Theseus, and in him, the Athenians saw the beginnings of democracy, which would set themselves apart from others in Greece. Theseus was raised by his mother, south of Athens, a woman who King Aegeus of Athens had once spent the night with. He had left a pair of sandals and a sword under a rock, so that if a son was to be born of the encounter, he was to be told, once old and strong enough, to lift the rock, collect the items, and travel to Athens. Once Theseus was old enough, he lifted the rock with ease and collected the items. Instead of taking the easy route to Athens, he travelled overland and had many trials along the way in the same vein as Heracles. Once in Athens, he survived an attempted assassination by King Aegeus's wife, Medea, and was recognised by the king as his son. Next, he travelled to Crete, where he helped slay the Minotaur in the labyrinth. This freed the Athenians of the price of providing seven male youths and maidens to King Minos of Crete, so he could feed his half-bull, half-man monster of the maze. After escaping the maze and making his way back to Athens, Theseus forgot to fly a white flag, which signalled his triumphant return. King Aegeus, seeing the black sail of morning, assumed the worst, and jumped into the sea, drowning himself, to where the sea he dove into would be known as the Aegean Sea and still is today. Theseus would be crowned king, but refused to rule in this manner, and set up a commonwealth of sorts, and made himself commander-in-chief. He also arranged for all citizens to be treated as equals, and a system of voting to be established. This is but an extremely brief summary of Theseus and his exploits, but shows how much importance a city that lacks written records of its past places in a single figure, ascribing to them many great exploits and reasoning for their being and way of life. This helped explain to the Athenians where their systems first developed, which to them seemed natural. But now let's turn from the explanation provided by a mythological past and look at Athens' development from more historical terms, and their road towards reform and democracy, even if this and its figures will also be somewhat murky in the historical record. In the Bronze Age, the site at Athens had grown to be an important centre in its region, and would have been a tough fortress to crack. Like what we have seen at Mycenae in the later part of Mycenaean times, measures had been taken so that the inhabitants in the fortress had access to a water supply without being hindered by enemies in the region. This appears to have been an addition at the site in the later stages, where there were signs of destruction elsewhere in the Mycenaean world. Interestingly though, no signs of destruction have been found at the Mycenaean period remains of Athens. Thoughts for Athens remaining untouched range from the site being too formidable to take by force, to the region was not as desirable to invaders, who bypassed it for more fertile areas. Simply put, the risk versus reward wasn't worth it. Though the Bronze Age Athenians had taken measures to protect themselves nevertheless. The evidence suggesting that the Athenians were not overcome by invaders also corresponds with the notion that they were of an unbroken ethnic group from their early history to classical times. Herodotus and Thucydides both refer to the Athenians as being Pelasgian people, with Pelasgian referring to people who were indigenous to Greece before the other groups had moved into the region. In the ancient sources, the Athenians are represented as being very proud of this fact, and terms such as sprouted from the earth are used to describe them. From the evidence that we saw in our episode on the collapse of the Mycenaeans, there is very little to suggest that Athens suffered the same fate as the other major settlements. If this is the case, they may well have shifted into the Dark Ages still somewhat intact, though the loss of connections to the other major centres would have affected their trade 
therefore their economy and social structures. Evidence seems to suggest that the villages surrounding Athens were abandoned during troubles at the end of the Bronze Age, with people possibly seeking safety at Athens. Whatever the changes that took place during the Dark Ages are hard to tell, but it seems that if their trade was greatly affected, they were relatively quick at reorganising new trade contacts with the rest of the disrupted Greek world. Archaeological evidence found around Athens dating back to the Dark Age period seems to indicate this recovery. It seems likely that the main reasons for their trade networks to recover quicker than other settlements was due to their area being relatively unaffected by the destruction events and their central location in the Greek mainland. Most trade that was being conducted from the north to the south and vice versa would pass close to Athens. Although Athens may have recovered their trade networks, they were still only a relatively minor village in the Greek world. At the time of the Spartan expansion, to be an Athenian was referring to someone who lived in the town of Athens. The idea of the polis and people from the surrounding countryside to also be known as Athenians was still to take shape. Sparta had become a larger political power, but it had to be maintained by the sword, where Athens would eventually gain more control over the surrounding regions through more peaceful means. It could be that, as the repopulation of the surrounding villages took place during the Dark Ages, with families from Athens returning to their ancestral villages, a common linkage with the peoples of Attica could have developed with the centralised location of Athens, which may have made the future unification with Athens more conducive. Classical Athens would become one of the leaders of new ideas and systems, but heading out of the Dark Ages, Athens appears to have been attempting to return to the good old days of how life was under a Bronze Age kingship. It is hard to tell if Athens in this period was ruled by a king in the sense of a single sovereign ruler, as the word used in ancient sources in describing the ruler was Basileus. How the word Basileus is interpreted can lead to multiple conclusions on how Athens was ruled, as different ancient sources use this word to describe a sovereign ruler, a member of an aristocracy, a chieftain or a big man, and even a member of a council. The word Basileus appears that it may have come from an earlier Linear B word that referred to a local chieftain or court official, but as things stand now, we are unable to tell with any certainty how the Athenians organised themselves politically in the Dark Ages and heading into the Archaic period. The Athenians may well have been ruled by a king in their earlier history, but society was now headed by the aristocracy known as the Eupatridae, which meant good fathered. Around them a governing system had been developed. Before any major reforms occurred that started leading Athens down the path of democracy, a constitution was in place that gives us all a sense of how Athens was run in the 7th century BC. Most of the information that gives us a picture of this period is found in a work, The Athenian Constitution, attributed to the 3rd century philosopher and tutor of Alexander the Great, Aristotle. Though it is generally agreed today that it was most likely written by one of his students around 300 BC, nevertheless it is still important in our understanding. There are also fragments and comments from many other ancient writers that add to the picture, though the Athenian Constitution is the most complete surviving work. The Athenian Constitution outlines three organs that made up the government. These were known as the Archons, who were selected leaders, of whom there were nine of, with three holding more senior ranks. There was the Areopagus, which was a council of former Archons who worked in tandem with the active Archons and had much control over the state administration. Thirdly, there was the Assembly, which was a function of the people, but was not used in any meaningful democratic way, only meeting on the whim of the other two organs. Let's have a bit of a closer look at how these organs operated. As we said, there were nine archons, which referred to a magistrate or political official. By this stage, an archon could only serve for one year, and could not be re-elected. This had been watered down from earlier times, where archons had originally elected for life, and then reduced to ten years. It is also important to note that only men of the Eupatridae, or noble class, were elected, or most likely chosen, to hold this title. Of the nine, three of them held senior roles which put them in charge of different areas of Athenian political life. The first was known as the Basileus, which as we have seen, is a title that referred to a king in the Bronze Age, but now the Archon, who held this title, was responsible for all religious matters of the polis. The Greeks took religious matters very seriously, and saw the gods intervening in all aspects of their lives. The Basileus would have ensured the gods were not offended, and treated properly to prevent any unfortunate events taking place in Athens. Next was the office of Polemarch whose responsibility covered all matters of warfare, 
the word polemos meaning war in Greek. He also dealt with issues regarding the metics of Athens. These were the residents of Athens who did not have citizen rights. The third title was that of the eponymous archon, who looked after all other civil matters. This role appears to have been the oldest of the archons, with the other two being added later. And when faction fighting broke out between the Eupatridae, it was always over this position. The word eponymous indicates that the holder of this office gave his name to that year, and this is how the Greeks kept their chronology. For example, if the Greeks referred to an event taking place, such as an attempted coup of Chilon, which we will be covering very soon, they would have said it happened in the archonship of Megacles, as he was the eponymous archon. Then in our modern understanding of chronology, this would be the same as saying 632 to 631 BC. The remaining six archon positions were referred to collectively as the Thesmothetae, which roughly meant those who lay down the rules. They acted as assistants to the three senior archons, but also drew up cases for the other three archons to reside over in judicial disputes. The next organ in the constitution was the Areopagus, which literally means Hill of Ares, Ares being the god of war in Greek mythology. Presumably the name given to this council reflected where they met, as there was a hill of Ares not far from the Acropolis. This office was held for life, and when archons finished their terms, they entered the Areopagus to join other previous serving archons. This council had enormous influence in the running of the polis and appears to be the main driving force behind the Athenians' affairs and had full authority in dispensing of punishment for the disorderly. The importance of this council is reflected in many ancient sources where they always refer to this group as being the guardians of the laws. Even though this council received new members every year, its political outlook varied very little since all of its members were drawn from the Eupatridae so only their class had representation in the constitution. The final organ was that of the assembly, where the people of Athens would meet, which in this period seems to have either lost its importance in the constitution, or was only seeing its beginnings. It is what we see as being the democratic element of the constitution, but for now it only seems to have met on the whims of the Archons and Areopagus, only to receive information from them, not to make any meaningful decisions in their own right. As time goes on though, this organ will gain much influence and would be one of the main driving forces in Athenian policies and decisions. This constitutional system that was in place had been refined generation after generation to further the advance of the Eupatridae cause and look after their own interests. What the system didn't do was look out for the interests of the majority of the population and by the 7th century a clear class distinction was in place and much resentment. If measures were not taken to try and address the divide between the rich and the poor, then it was likely that violence and civil war could erupt. Something did appear that would try to help the plight of the poor majority. It was a curious new political figure known as the tyrant. A tyrant in the 7th and 6th century didn't have the same negative meaning it does today. A tyrant was someone who gained political power outside the established legitimate means and ruled in their own right. The title didn't indicate that they were cruel or unjust but in fact some tyrants of this period were no worse than the system they replaced, and a few were even better. In the sources that we have, we hear of tyrants first emerging in the city-states on the Peloponnese, but Athens wouldn't be too far behind in its experience with this new political leader. Almost all tyrants came from the aristocracy of their polis, but became the champion of the people and gained popular support, which would enable them to rule in their own right. From the tyrannies that we know of, once established, they never tended to last more than a couple of generations. Tyrants would have their sons inherit their power, which could change the dynamics and remember their foundation of power was popular support of the people, which could be very fickle. Athens' first foray into tyranny would be unsuccessful, but showed that the social conditions were present which would allow tyrants to emerge. In 632 BC, a member of the Athenian Eupatridae named Chilon gathered his Athenian supporters and supporters from the polis of Megara where his father-in-law ruled as tyrant. They took control of the Acropolis, but it seems Chilon had misjudged his attempt, as instead of being supported by the people, once they realised what was happening, they besieged him and his followers. As with most unsuccessful events in Greek history, a divine explanation can be found. An account given by Thucydides says Chilon was instructed by the Delphic Oracle to seize the Acropolis on the Grand Festival of Zeus. Chilon thought this to mean the Olympic Games that took place on the Peloponnese. Thucydides suggests that if he took the oracle to mean the Diasia festival, he may have been successful, 
as the people would have been outside the city taking part and not in position to respond as they did. In any event, Kylon seems to have failed to gain the popular support of the people for his attempt and was now forced to seek sanctuary with his supporters in the Temple of Athena. They were promised that their lives would be spared if they surrendered and left the protection of the temple. They agreed, but Kylon appears to have slipped away. The promise of safety was revoked, and many of the Athenian and Megarian supporters of Kylon were killed. We are told that after this, strife between the two groups of supporters broke out, and war between Athens and Megara followed. All the trouble that occurred was blamed on the Alcmionidae family in Athens, who were part of the Eupatridae. As one of their members, Megacles, who was Archon, was responsible for the breaking of the oath to the men who had sought sanctuary. In Greek religious view, the killing of people under the protection of a god was seen as a great pollution, and was asking for trouble from the gods. Action had to be taken to correct the act of pollution, and to bring the city back in favour with the gods. The Athenians ended up placing the Alcyonidides under a curse and banished the family from Athens and then a sage from Crete was brought in to conduct purification rituals on the city. The events around Kylon, his failed attempt, and the aftermath may have helped the Eupatridae realise that some action was needed. The discontent from the lower levels of society was reaching all-time lows, with farmers having to sell their farms to make good on their loans, and even in more growing cases, sell themselves and family members into slavery to pay off what they had owed. Another class of society was developing into a more important and larger voice, and this was the hoplite class. A hoplite was a soldier in the Greek world, but a new type of soldier than that of the warriors of old. A hoplite was a heavily armed soldier that fought in closed rank formation known as a phalanx, that was around eight men deep. They were armed with a spear and a small sword as a secondary weapon, and for protection wore greaves, a breastplate, a helmet, and held a shield in their left arm, called an aspis. Hoplon, which is where they get their name from, though Hoplon refers more generally to equipment. They didn't fight as individual men, but as a group in close coordination. Their aspis was used to protect the man next to them, in effect creating a shield wall, protecting the phalanx. The hoplite was a fairly new development in warfare, and seems to have disrupted the status quo in other Greek city-states of the top-heavy aristocratic systems. Gaining their support for a popular ruler, seems to have been a key element in being able to form a tyranny, since this group was now much more important to the polis as it guaranteed its security. What made this group politically different to the warriors of the old was the majority of its members were not of the aristocratic class, so a new voice was brewing and becoming louder. When the ruling class know the importance of a group to its society, and that group are aware of their importance, they are ignored at the peril of those rulers. This would have been in the minds of the Eupatridae, who now sought to attempt to address these issues that were spiralling out of control, but not out of the kindness of their own hearts, but to attempt to keep power in their own hands. The next we hear of any sort of action being taken was some ten years later, when a man by the name of Draco was given authority to draw up a code of laws for Athens. We don't hear much about Draco's background in the ancient sources. Most of what we know comes from the Athenian constitution and in Plutarch's work on Solon another Athenian figure that we'll encounter next. This code would be the first officially written down and set up in a public place for all citizens to see. Previously the laws were discussed orally and really only understood in the circles of the Areopagus, where much of the punishment was dealt out. We must note that in this period there was a change starting to occur in where the responsibility lay in obtaining justice for crimes against individuals. Previously, it was accepted practice that an individual or their family were responsible in securing justice for a crime committed against themselves. This type of system often led to blood feuds developing between families. For example, if a person were murdered, it would be the responsibility of the murdered person's family to seek justice from the criminal or their family. Often economic compensation was arrived at, though it wasn't uncommon for the victim's family to put in act the notion of an eye for an eye either against the criminal or a family member. This sort of behaviour would then lead to a cycle of revenge that could last generations as both sides reacted as victims when justice was being attempted at. What started taking place was a system where the state itself became responsible for the justice of crimes committed against individuals, therefore putting an end to the cycle of blood feuds. Draco's law code seems to be an attempt at transitioning or further transitioning the responsibility from the victim to the state. 
it appears that the code was also an effort to try and standardise other elements of the legal system so that a greater part of the population would know what to expect from it and justice wasn't left to the whims of the Eupatridae. In effect, it was starting to head down the road that all were treated equally in the eyes of the law. Today, the legacy of Draco is still remembered through our word draconian, meaning a harsh measure. Reportedly, when Draco put forward his code, the penalty for most of the crimes outlined was death. Plutarch in his biographies writes, It is said that Draco himself, when asked why he fixed the punishment of death for most offences, answered that he considered these lesser crimes to deserve it, and he had no greater punishment for more important ones. It is interesting to note that in Greek, the word dracon means serpent or dragon, which could be in reference to the harshness of his penalty systems, and the name attributed to him later on. Though the changes in standardisation of the legal system in Athens failed to address the major issues affecting the majority of Athenians, their voices were still not represented in the political apparatus. More of the lands that they worked were ending up in hands of fewer, while families were still being torn apart with family members being sold into slavery. The attempt that was made to address the issue in society so far involved the Eupatridae not having to share political power. This was a misjudgment on their part, and failure to address the real issue at hand saw conflict between the classes break out repeatedly for the next 25 years. Eventually the Athenians did something truly radical, but desperate times called for desperate measures. Both sides of the political divide turned to one man and agreed to give him full authority, making him extraordinary archon. The man they turned to went by the name of Solon, who would be remembered by Athenians as a great lawmaker, statesman and poet. He would eventually, by later Greeks, be known as one of the seven sages of ancient Greece, and would often be presented as a wise man in stories. Some would even refer to him as the father of democracy, even though this was probably not his goal. Solon was born in 630 BC, in Athens, as part of the Eupatridae, but seems to have become involved in commerce, something the aristocracy tended to steer clear of in a time where birth and family connections determined class, not money. This background may have seen both sides agree on him becoming Archon, as both sides of society could relate to him in some way. Also, Solon was known as a poet, and most of his views on politics could be heard in his poetry, which he had written down before taking office. So the Athenians already had an idea of what his views and the potential changes he might make. With the task before him, he was said to have kept in mind both the rich and poor. Though from his surviving poetry, he does seem to lay most of the blame for the current troubles in Athens at the feet of the Eupatridae. With his view to compromise, we hear that both sides of society were left disappointed. Perhaps each side took what they wanted out of his poetry, looking at what suited them. The rich were to keep their financial advantage, but also lost out on debts that were owed to them. A policy of what was known as the shaking off of obligations was enacted that benefited the poor, but the policy of land redistribution didn't eventuate as most had hoped. This shaking off freed previously acquired farms through debt repayments back to their original owners and also released Athenians and their families from slavery, giving them back their freedom which they had paid for in the most dire circumstances. Making sure that this wouldn't happen again, Solon also outlawed the sale of any Athenian into slavery from that point on. The practice of slavery didn't stop, but now slaves would not be Athenian and would mostly be non-Greek. Solon also turned to how the economy of Athens could be stimulated and put in effect some reforms. He attempted to bar the export of all natural produce apart from olives. This was done as a greater profit could be made through the export benefiting the owner of the land to the detriment of the polis, and this is what had helped contribute to food shortages at Athens. Olives were a much hardier crop and much more suited to the climate and soil of Attica. By promoting the growth of olive groves, Solon was helping protect Athens from famine to a greater extent than before, as they were less likely to fail. Also, it was still encouraging an export market, as the olives and products made from them could be produced in excess of what the polis needed. This also allowed the profits to be spent on the crops that were much harder for the Athenians to grow themselves, therefore importing a more reliable flow of food to the city. Though it seems the coercion wasn't strong enough, or the take-up was very slow, as this practice wouldn't take hold for at least another 50 years. Another way he helped the Athenian economy was passing a law that held fathers responsible for teaching their sons a skill in trade. This would provide a greater number of skilled workers helping boost the Athenian economy. To encourage this practice, the sons were then responsible 
for the care of their father in old age. Though if he had failed in his duty, then the sons were not held to account for his care. Keep in mind that there was no government-run aged care facilities. This was the responsibilities of the families. In the political and social sphere, Solon created a new rank structure, which could allow for citizens to take part in political processes to a greater extent than before. The system put people into four different groups based on their annual wealth, which was measured in agricultural produce. The four different ranks were the 500 measure men, the horsemen who produced 300 measures, presumably this group is where the cavalry was drawn from, the yoked men, this is where the main part of the hoplite class came from, being able to afford the appropriate armour and weapons with their 200 measures. Finally, there was the feats, referring to the labourers who produced less than 200 measures. The system still had its limitations though. The top three classes could hold an office in political life, but the feats could not, though they were still able to attend the assembly and vote. This system was a major change as now a greater proportion of Athenian citizens had access to political positions. It was no longer just the Eupatridae. Also, the system now allowed for mobility in the ranks, as someone's rank was now based upon their wealth, not their birth. It would promote individual initiative, entrepreneurship, and would allow for citizens to move up the different ranks, opening up more political opportunities. Further to this, Solon has been attributed to creating the Council of the 400, known as the Boule. The council was made up of 400 citizens, who were chosen by lot from the three highest ranks in society. This now allowed issues to be raised that affected a much broader range of society, since they were represented in a greater deal now. It was the Boulay's job to create an agenda to put forward to be discussed at the assembly. This now breathed new life into the assembly, as Solon required it to meet more regularly, and not just when the Eupatridae wanted it to. It was here in the assembly where the fourth rank, the Thetes, engaged in political matters, bringing all four ranks together in the new political system. This re-energising of the assembly would be the beginnings of the voice of the people and the democratic element of the system having more bearing on the political landscape than before. As decisions on domestic and foreign policy were now voted on with all the ranked classes present, the assembly was also now a check on the system. The men taking on the archonship roles were voted into position from here. Also, after an archon's term was up, the assembly could hold an inquiry into their time in office if it was believed that they had acted in a corrupt manner. Solon's reforms also extended into the judicial systems. He made it possible for any male citizen to bring charges against someone on behalf of the victim. Previously, only the injured party or their family could put charges forward. This would now make it much harder to intimidate a victim to avoid prosecution. He also created a system of appeal where a person could bring before the assembly a case where he believed a magistrate had made an unjust or biased decision. Solon also reformed most of the laws put forward by Draco, though we are told his law regarding murder was left untouched. We are also told that he put in place a whole range of other laws dealing with wills, inheritance, general social behaviour and a range of laws applying to women, which in our day comes across as repressive, but we need to look at the context of the period under its own terms. Most of these laws applied to citizen women and in one way or another restricted the contact she would have with male strangers. What was extremely important and would continue to be for the Athenian family and polis was the legitimacy of the children of a citizen family. As being a citizen allowed for that child, if male, to grow up and take part in political affairs, or if a girl, it would make her desirable to other male Athenians as she could produce more legitimate Athenians. So if the loyalty of an Athenian wife could be called into question, it could put a question over the legitimacy of all the children she had produced. So being able to be certain of the legitimacy of Athenian children continued families to grow from generation to generation and also provided a stable citizen base to govern the polis for time to come. Eventually, once all his reforms were in place, Solon made a decision to leave Athens and travel for 10 years. What seems to have led to this decision was a common complaint from the Athenians that his laws were ambiguous and not clear enough, so Solon would be forever asked for his advice on many cases and laws. By departing Athens, Solon would leave the people to work out the laws for themselves, and would learn how to interpret them on a case-by-case -case basis, as his intention was not to draw up a series of laws that could be blindly followed, but allow each case to be heard on its own merits. So here, Solon departs the stage of Athenian affairs, but he will make a cameo appearance or two as we move on through the episodes and encounter other important figures.
With the departure of Solon and a reform constitution, it would seem Athens was left with a system that would see the end of civil strife and encourage the cooperation of the classes. This is what happened, well at least for four years. Then the old troubles started appearing in society again, with the tensions between rich and poor, nobles and non-nobles. Even though Solon had left a more progressive and inclusive constitution, there were still problems, which mainly revolved around the notion of change. People generally don't like change, especially when they can't see an immediate personal benefit. The changes that the different groups accepted were seen not to go far enough in their eyes, a common problem of compromise and balancing different social groups. One of the factors that probably had the most influence on the system breaking down was that of the attempt to break down the barriers between the Eupatridae and the common people. Some constitutional reforms over a few years were never going to eliminate this ancient social structure overnight. The Eupatridae would put up resistance and do what they could to try and keep their rightful place in society, which would lead to more attempted tyrannies and periods of anarchy, as we will see in our next episode. Though, with all this said, we must not forget that with the troubles at hand, Solon has started the ball rolling on what would become democracy after other reforms were made later on. Small incremental changes in society are much more tolerated and become normal, where trying to completely change society generally leads to very unstable times and even the destruction of that society. With hindsight, Solon seems to have hit the middle of these two paths. Athens would recover and in the future would prosper. Next time we return, we will take a look at the next 50 years of political unrest, with its attempted tyrannies, periods of anarchy, and then an established tyranny leading to some stability, which would help Athens move further down the road of democracy with some help from more influential figures. Thank you for your continued support. To receive updates and to be notified of new episodes, you can subscribe at castingthroughancientgreece.com. Also, you can follow the series on Facebook at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. I hope you can join me next time for episode 11, Athens, Democracy Rises.